Pick Up The Pace is a rugby union podcast hosted by All Black super fan and Anadu Ryle. Two passionate rugby fanatics from Wainui or Mata, New Zealand, who go deep into everything rugby without taking themselves too seriously. Welcome back to Pick Up The Pace podcast. You with your man, All Black super fan and Anadu Ryle. And from across the ditch in Australia, son of Tatilia and Tukula, he was born in Fiji and from the village of Namatakula. He moved to Australia with his family at the age of three and he went to Sunnybank State High School in Brisbane. He played 99 NRL games for the Brisbane Broncos, winning one premiership, six State of Origin games in Queensland, four rugby league test matches for Fiji, appearing in one World Cup, and nine rugby league test matches for Australia. He then switched to rugby union and played 89 super rugby games for the New South Wales Waratahs, 67 rugby union test matches for Australia, appearing in two World Cups, a brief stint playing rugby union for Leicester in the UK before returning to the NRL with the West Tigers, where he played 52 games. Then he briefly went back to rugby union to play for Leinster in Ireland before returning to play his final season with the South Sydney Rabbitohs, winning his second NRL premiership. A massive kia ora, bola vanaka, and welcome to Pick Up The Pace podcast, Lotte Tengeri. Hey, that's a great intro, boys. Thank <laughs> you very much. Bula, bula. Bula. Lotte? You were born in Fiji, and you're yep. from the village of Namatakula. Can you yep. tell us about Namatakula, and do you still have a strong connection there, bro? Yeah, well, I I, I try and get back every year. I um, it's a really strong connection with, with the Fijian community, not, not only in Brisbane, but uh, with, with my heritage and that part of Fiji. You know, I um, yeah, it's just great to sort of get back there. And, and there's a lot of history steeped, I guess, in that village of rugby players. Um, coming out of there, and uh, I guess as a <clears throat> as a young kid, I didn't feel the pressure, but I felt immense pride about where I was from and, uh, and and the sort of people they produce and the rugby players they produce. So that sort of I guess spurred me on to sort of different do different things in rugby and uh, you know help the psyche um, from an early age. So your mother uh, Titilia and father Tukula move you yep. and your siblings over to Australia when you're free. So what were the reasons behind the move, bro, to Australia? Yeah, yeah. so my um, my father came over initially to play for a rugby club in Brisbane, Brisbane, Australia. Uh, it's obviously where I'm living now. But I, um, yeah, so he came over first, asked him to come over, to test it out. And then we moved over about three months later. And uh, I guess we've been here ever since. Played a GPS rugby with his older brother who came over, I think, a year uh, beforehand, yeah, there's there's a big Fijian community in Brisbane, and I guess uh, there was a lot of Fijians, well, not a lot, but maybe five or six uh, Fijians spread out at the time um, playing rugby in the local A grade competition, um, which is called Premier Rugby now, um, which is a tier under uh, Super Rugby in Brisbane, um, it's club rugby, and um, yeah, and there's a lot of kids now that. Uh, that have you know obviously gone on and done a few different things um, that have spurned from from that uh, from that era of, of, of men coming over to Australia um, to ply their trade. Coming from Fiji, bro, at three years old, what were some of the yep. Fijian customs and values that your parents passed down to you and your siblings through? <laughs> Remind you where you came from, bro. Yeah, well, yeah, there was a lot, a lot of customs and values. So I grew up in the church, um, and. You know, we uh, very, very strict upbringing. I don't know about you guys, but mm. I know in Islander communities and Maori uh, communities, mm. um, you know, it's father, mum, they're both quite hard and quite strict. That was, it was a pretty tough upbringing. Um, and, you know, back then, moving to Australia, um, there was a lot of, you know, it, was, and it wasn't multicultural, but it was a tough upbringing coming and, and, and being having dark skin um, at the time. Um, I was a minority back then, not not so much now, mm. but back then I, I, I guess it I guess it was, and um, you know having the upbringing of, of I guess from a Fijian point of view, just to sort of not turn your back but turn the other cheek and you know um, be respectful of, of what you have and a lot of gratitude I think Fijians have um, for what they have. Um, you know we going back to the village these days, they still don't have a lot. Um, it hasn't been too long since they've had uh, electricity put on um, and everything else. So uh, the world's changing over there, but for the better, I don't know. But uh, it's, um, yeah, it, it made me uh, have a sense of community here, um, which was great, but also to be wary of, um, you know, the, we, we were a minority at the time. 
So you grew up in Sunnybank. Uh, can you share some stories of what life was like growing up as a young Fijian man in a new country? Yeah, I guess um, yeah, it was different, eh? It was different. I, um, I definitely uh, grew up thinking, well, knowing I was different. I'm going to school and, you know, there was a, a little bit, a fair bit of racism going on. Um, you know, I, I, I went to Sunnybank um, State High School, but I, I uh, went to a few different schools. Um, but I grew up in Logan, which was good, I grew up and, and uh, you know, which is in, on the south side of Brisbane. And luckily at the time, there was a, there was a lot of, um, yeah, it was quite multicultural back then, um, and it's more so even now. So it was good growing up in that area because you had people on your side who were going through the same thing. There was a lot of, um, you know, there was Asians, there was Samoans, Papua New Guineans, Fijians, um, Kiwis like yourselves, boys. Um, all sort of melting in there um, and having, a, I guess, a common um, feeling of of being from another country. So that was good. Um, but, yeah, I uh, I enjoyed it. Caught the train every day to school and then um, really wanted to play footy at a certain age because I always had um, – I was always grew up with, with a lot of rugby and rugby league around me. Um, used to spend a lot of time at my my uncle's house after church on a Sunday. I'd go back there and try to stay there for the whole week. But I get clipped over the years to come home to go back to school. Um, and everything else used to he, he used to have chickens in his backyard. He used to run around with them with the, with a rugby ball, um, stepping stepping around um, hibiscus bushes and mango trees and orange and mandarin trees, which was which was part of the upbringing as well. But it was it was um, it was great. I used to just go out, outside to escape. Um, and, and my escapism at the time um, was with the football and playing with the footy in my hand. So you went to Sunnybank State High School in, in Brizzy, as mentioned, bro. Um, yep, yep. Is that where you first started playing competitive rugby league? And at what point were you scouted for the Broncos? Yeah, so I was um, – at that point, I think I um, I only started playing when I was un, in under 15. So I went to Sunnybank State High School from year eight. And, you know, I had obviously a good bunch of mates and – you know, I was there for a couple of years, and they all were playing there. And we always play lunchtime. Um, and I, know, I thought I, I was getting, went okay, and the other, the other boys thought I did as well. But um, they said, "Why don't you come down? This is probably in year ten, under 15s and have a game with us um, and play on the weekend." Because, as you know, boys and a lot of Islander uh, kids would know, um, Sundays are for church. And uh, that's what they play. So I, I didn't – I always wanted to play, but I never really asked a question because I knew what the answer would be. Um, but at, at one point, I um, plucked up the courage, and I think I got one of the boys to call my parents <laughs> in oh. under 15s. One of those ones about – I couldn't tell them, ask them myself because I knew what the answer would be. You know, with, with um, Islander parents, someone else asks, you know, you might get another another answer. Um, and they asked, and you know, lo and behold, my, my, I think it was my dad, or my, I said, yeah. But then the next thing was, um, I, I actually couldn't pay for the fees, like the rego fees and that. So I think it was back then, 150, 200 bucks a year or something like that. And then, uh, so I spoke to the coach, and the coach said, well, if you mow my lawn wherever I, I need it, I, I'll pay your fees. So it sort of started from this. He used to pick me up from training and then drop me off at the same. And uh, had a had a great time in under 15 South Sunnybank Junior Rugby League Club, same club that um, spurned uh, Jonathan Thurston played there as well. And then um, so I started there, went through under 15s, undefeated. I couldn't believe it. First year, um, won the premiership. And I was thinking, how good's this? Um, and then under 15s, as you know, boys. After that year, they we won the comp. I think a few of them sort of had been playing for a long, long time. And we didn't have a team in under 15s, under 16, sorry. So the team disbanded after that year. They'd done it all, the boys. Here's me in my first year. And a lot of them had played five, six, seven, eight years already. And they, they, I think they had enough. So I went over to South's, not South's, um, Brothers Logan, which back then was um, Brothers St. Paul's. Um, which was a, another big club, and that was actually closer to me, closer to where I live, which was great. Um, and I um, played there and got picked up during the game in, in a semi-final. I think it was the next year, 
playing for Brothers Logan. Another another good year. Uh, yeah, played in that game in the semi final. After the game, Cyril Connell, uh, Phil Hall actually was was the guy who was the scout. He um, he came and had a chat to me after the game and said, "Would you would you think about mind um, having a chat and wanting to go on a, a Brisbane Broncos scholarship? What, what do you think?" You know, give us your details. We'll get uh, Cyril Connell, who's the the big um, was a old great talent identification guy at the Brisbane Broncos. Great scout. Um, gave me a call that night, and uh, or gave my uncle's house a call because we didn't have a, have a phone. Um, and I, that's where I was, and and it went from there, I guess. And uh, I, I started, uh, and I signed. Uh, scholarship deal with the Brisbane Broncos when I was 16. So I was in year 11 at school. And uh, I think from there, I um, was firmly, the seed was firmly planted that uh, I could make a living out of this. And I've been given a go here. I should make the most of this opportunity. So you made your Broncos debut off the bench in 1999. You joined the team that obviously included greats such as Wendell Saylor, Gordon Tallis, Darren Lockyer, Kevin Walters, Alan Langer. The list goes on, bro. How did it feel playing in a team yeah, full of on. rugby league superstars? Unbelievable, unbelievable. I, I remember going in my first one of my first camps at the Broncos. Um, they invited a heap of kids to train with with the older guys, uh, and well, there would have been about fifty or sixty of us kids um, there were between the ages of 16, 16 and eighteen. And um, yeah, overall, because you know, I, I'm looking at these guys. Okay, there's here, there's Alan Langer, there's uh, Steve Branoff. You know the list goes on. Yeah. It's like, holy hell, what am I? What am I actually doing here? You know. <laughs> uh, and then I look at the guys who who were with me that were in my cohort. Um, these guys, I'd never played any rep sport um, as a, as a young bloke uh, because I, I actually just never played it. And these guys all played for Queensland schoolboys, Australian schoolboys big guns out of the Queensland system and I'm thinking to myself these guys are guns you know, do I really belong here and I rem- remember quite vividly Wayne Bennett saying um, he had a chat to us before that training session um, saying that you know this, it's great you, you've here you're here but the one thing I got out of it was that out of this group he actually said to us there'll only be two or three that'll make it that'll play first grade and as I said before I looked around thinking well, I haven't played uh, any rep uh, or, or anything, and, and these guys are—they're all buddy superstars here already in my division, and even older that you sort of hear about. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, I've got to work pretty hard. But lo and behold, two or you know, a year or two later, out of that group, um, there was only two guys that made, it, and that was uh, me and a guy called Sean Berrigan. So Wayne was right um, in, in, in saying that. But, um, yeah, unbelievable experience being at the Broncos at that time. Um, growing up, I, I actually supported the Canberra Raiders, uh, watching guys like Malman Ingalls, Noah Andruka. He's from my village, actually. Uh, we're related. So that was a connection there. Well, I, I just couldn't believe going to that club, putting on the gear in the first place, training gear, Looking at Alan Langer walking the train, and Kevin Walters, Wendell Saylor driving in with his, you know, BMW pumping Tupac Me Against the World. Or <laughs> he thought he was the man, you know, with his with his gold chains and everything. Else. I thought he was the man at the time. So in 2000, bro, the Broncos won an NRL title with a 14 to six win yeah. over the Sydney Roosters in the grand final. You also scored yeah. the first try, bro, with a beautiful line to take the inside ball from Darren Lockyer. What was it like winning that first premiership ring? Oh, it was unbelievable. Like I, in 99, when I made my debut, uh, I, was still, I still pinched myself sort of thinking about it. Yeah, in 2000, uh, it, it was amazing. It was just amazing to be in that squad. So I came in at a time, I keep harping back to it, Alan Langer was halfback, Kevin Walters was fullback, Steve Randolph was playing in the centres, Darren Lockyer was fullback, Wendell Sale was on the other side. Jeez. You got Brad Thorne, Petro, Sivan the Siva. Gordon Tallis, Shane Webke, Luke Prittis, all in the front, you know, all in the pack. Tony Carroll. I'm thinking to myself, wow, yeah, yeah. I just in in this caliber of player um, was unbelievable. When I think back on it now, I'm thinking, you know, how did we even lose games? 
um, yeah. with all those sort of great players. So that was an amazing year. You know, as a young guy, you, you're thinking to yourself at the time, I was thinking, well, I'm a part of this great squad. You know, how easy, not easy, but how good is this? You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to at least another two or three in the next couple of years. But that obviously wasn't to be. But 2000, you know, we, we looked at our thing on the paper, our, our team lineups on the paper. And even before that final, actually, we, we, we had a team meeting the night before and Wayne actually put those two teams up. Um, on a whiteboard in a, in a team meeting to look at it, you know they the other team, uh, Sydney Roosters at, at the time, they had Brad Fitler and they had a few players that were, they were all right, but he put the both of the teams up on the whiteboard and thought to, and said to us, um, "Who would you leave out out of our team to put one of their players in?" And we looked at it from a man, no one really, and you know who would you, who's going to really rock our boat? Yeah. Um, and from there, I thought. You know, the confidence was there. We just had to go out on the on the Sunday afternoon and put it out in the field to, you know, everyone played our best ability, which we sort of did. It, it wasn't one of the best ever grand finals, but, you know, it didn't have to be. We, we've got the, I've got the ring to show for it. Uh, I think we won by eight, six to eight points, I think it was. But, yeah, scoring that first try in front of 90-odd thousand people was amazing, absolutely wow. amazing. Awesome, bro. Hey, after the 2000 grand final, you then travelled over to England to captain Fiji at the Rugby League World Cup. Oh, yeah, was yeah. I was only thinking about that the other night. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how special was it, bro, captaining your country of birth at a World Cup as a yeah. 20-year-old, as a youngster? <laughs> yeah, that's, um, you know, I've got to say, that's probably one of my better memories of uh, of representing each other and playing in a jersey. Uh, you know, I, I just had a great year in 2000, obviously winning the premiership, but I was full of confidence and full of, uh, you know, I was confident in, in my ability to sort of, do things, but then having the captaincy heaped on me, I was like, oh, okay, you know, I guess I've got to do it. Uh, I'm a more a leader who leads by example rather than um, by talk. Uh, so that's what all I tried to do over there. Uh, and we had a great time. We were, we were based up in Newcastle, I think is sort of north, northeast, um, up that way in England. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a time in my life where, you know, you're just having having fun, and, and with a lot of guys from um, the, the, there was maybe two or three of us that had played NRL, had NRL experience, and the rest were playing country league in in, 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 in sorry Australia, and and a lot of the boys were from Fiji, and we just had a great time. I, I still talk to a few of those boys now, you know, share memories of going okay. You know, we we only won one game against Russia. I think that was a Barrow at a stadium where. You know, one of the sides of the field went had a crazy slant on it. But, you know, to play against Australia uh, and play really well, I thought, um, and to play against England, who were in the same pool. I think, for me, it was sort of coming of an age where I, you know, I had confidence in my ability, but then to play Australia and score a try and play really well against them, um, we played at Gateshead uh, on a frightfully cold night. To play against them and to play really well and to get pats on the back from guys who you respect after the game. Um, you know, guys coming up to you and saying, uh, mate, I thought you played really well. Um, and it wasn't sort of pissing in your pocket stuff. It was, you know, guys were genuine about it and, and you know, gave me the confidence to say, oh, well, I'm actually not too bad. You know, I thought I led the team pretty well and, um, you know, we had a good time. But, yeah, I, I really re- gained a lot of confidence from, from that game first and foremost, and then uh, and then having a, a, a good tournament um, with the boys to go from there. It was, um, it was a great time in my life. Hey, so in 2001 and 2002, you were on fire. You were the highest try scorer for the Broncos in 2001, 21 tries. And at the 2002 Dally M Awards, you were named the winger of the year. How did the great Broncos coach Wayne Bennett get the best out of you, bro? Uh, how did he get the best out of me, I guess? It was a collective effort, I think, from from the team um, and, and from the ethos we had, I guess, as a group. You know, I, I was young, so I was malleable, in a sense. Um, then I probably was more malleable then than I was later on. Um, I think, you know, I, I was always Wayne was a great coach, um, but I think I got on better, not got on better, but the relationship blossomed probably more after I left, in a sense. 
um, because there was always that sort of you never want to do the wrong thing. It was all that father son thing, um, and I had guys in there at the Broncos um, who, who sort of push. We'd all push each other. Um, it was always competitive. The training was always competitive off the field too. There was Wayne really let me do my job. The places I've played, the best footy, the best rugby rugby league is where you're not feeling too much pressure, pressure from the coach. Um, you know he's got full confidence in you and your ability, uh, and you've just got to go out there and do it. I think places, and I see it now with younger guys, um, you can tell when they're playing too much in their head or they're playing a bit scared um, and, and they're not free. And, and Wayne probably let me play the way I wanted to play. Um, and places that I've played where I've enjoyed myself is, is where the coaches have, have let me do that. So you then went on to play Origin footy for Queensland in 01 and 02. Yeah. And that was also yeah. under Wayne Bennett. Everyone talks yeah. about the fierce rivalry between Queensland and New South Wales. And Origin has a steep history in Australian sport. What was it like being a part of that Origin experience, bro? Oh, man. I uh, It's the best experience I've had, you know, in a representative jersey. I know I, I just said before about playing in a, in a Fiji Bati jersey, but playing for Queensland, after growing up here, moving here when I was three, um, rugby league is a lot, and pretty much everything is the sport in Queensland. And I grew up idolising guys like Wally Lewis playing um, in origin, uh, Mal Meninga, all those guys, you know, Alan Langer. Uh, and then to get the call to play, to be asked to, to wear that jersey, uh, I felt immense pride. Because, um, you know, you, you, as a Queensland the kid, well, obviously growing up here, not being born but growing up, that's – and you play rugby league, that's the, that's the only jersey you want to play in. Um, whether it is now or, or – or it isn't. I think Queenslanders. It's probably tough to say. Queenslanders would rather play in a in a Queensland jersey than a Australian jersey. I don't know if that's you can you can say that, but I reckon that's still a fact today. That um, you know you'd rather pull on not rather, but there's a lot more passion and everything else in, in that Queensland jersey. Um, and, and you know we just harness that. Uh, as much as we could um, in those two years that I played, you know, 2001, we we win the series. Uh, 2002, we draw it, but, you know, we've already won the series a year before and uh, we take it home because we, we hold the shield. But two great series, um, you know, some great memories. 2001, I, I made my debut on that night in at Lane Park, the old Lane Park, which was it was still before it got redeveloped. Um, I was yeah, fortunate enough to play on that. I, I was stoked to play on that. I, I, I'd been there once or twice before. Obviously, used to watch different games, but I, I'd watched an Origin game when I was a kid there before. Um, so it was really, really cool to play there. Uh, yeah, and just being part of that group that I think there was 10 debutants that night in 2001, and I was one of them, uh, and we touched up New South Wales you know, by about 18 to 20 points, maybe more. I, I can't remember, but we, we were on fire that night. Uh, my first touch of the footy was unbelievable. I get a, get a ball from Lockie and sprint 40 metres, trip over myself trying to goose step the fullback and then step in and give it back to Lockie. That was my first touch two and a half minutes in. It was uh, it was an amazing experience. Um, and, you know, you know, stuff that still gives me goosebumps on the back of my neck. Um, or the hair stand up on the back of my neck uh, when I when I do see it, and I feel immense pride um, playing in that jersey and uh, having represented that jersey. And um, you know, now telling my, my sons a story about um, playing in that and and, you know, that, and them wanting to share the yeah. the pride in it. So playing State of Origin meant you had officially switched your allegiances, bro, from Fiji to Australia. Yeah. How difficult was it for you to make that decision? Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't at the time because I guess not not like what it is now. Um, Fiji would only really get together to play at World Cup times. We didn't have any mid-year test matches or 
or or anything like that. Um, and there wasn't a real big avenue in the international rugby league. There probably still isn't as much now, but they do play a, a fair bit more than what I did back then. So at the time, it, it, it was a, it was a little bit hard, but they just weren't playing footy, and I was like. I was at a time in my career where I just wanted to play, um, and then to play in a Queensland jersey was was amazing. Um, first and foremost, uh, and you know, I, as I said to you earlier, you grow up idolising that jersey. So it wasn't yeah. it was hard, but it wasn't in a sense. So you played for the Kangaroos in two thousand one and two thousand and two yeah. as well. Tell us about your time playing yep. for the Australian side, bro. Yeah, it was it was great. Um, I remember making my debut actually down your way, boys. Wellington, I think it was 2001. Oh, yeah. It's called a try on debut. It was in, in a great team, surrounded by amazing players. I remember, you know, just being in, in a team. You know, I played against these guys, but then and watching these guys like Joey Jones, absolute freak. You know, he did stuff with the footy. He, I actually, I think I scored a try off one of his kicks um, to, uh, to my debut try um, at the cake tin. For the kangaroos, uh, but one guy I, you know, I rated, but didn't rate it or rated more. Or so. so after I played with him was was Brad Fittler. He, um, you know, he, he, you'd always think of Brad Fittler having, having a great uh, left foot step, a big head fake, boom, get through the gap um, for his attacking ability and prowess. But what really impressed me was when I was I was coming through. Wayne Bennett loves. Coaching teams and coaching defenses, you know, defenses, good defenses win competitions. And I, I just didn't realize how good Brad Fittler was as a defender and the way he talked um, on the field in this communication. So I was on the wing. I think inside me may have been Ryan Girdler at two in. And, and I think Brad Fittler was playing three in. I think he was playing a lock at the time. Well, he may have been playing five eight. But he was, um, he was unbelievable. It, just in that short amount of time that I was in that. In a kangaroo jersey, Brad Fittler was a captain, and um, his leadership from a, uh, an actions point of view and, and the way he talked on the field was amazing. Great player. Late in 2002, bro, you joined recent converts Wendell Saylor and Matt Rogers by signing with the Australian Rugby Union. What was the driving factors to make that switch to Union, bro? As you, as you know, boys, my father, and as you know, Fijians, um, we love rugby union. It's, it's a national sport over there. Um, and I'd always watch them growing up. But in 2002, 2001, I think it was, or early 2002, I was playing in a – I shouldn't have been, but it was um, 2000 – start of – the end of 2001, actually. It was a, we, I was playing in seven Cup, and I shouldn't have been playing because um, I was signed <laughs> with the Broncos at the time. But it was with the Brisbane Fijian team we were playing a, a, in a scratch sevens tournament. And um, – well, there was a there was an Australian selector, I think, was there. He was just watching. You know, he lives in Brisbane, looking at making the switch, mate. Um, here's my number. Here's my card. Um, we can go from there, mate. And, just, and then um, I put it away, but I didn't think too much of it. But then, you know, it was that itch that was that was created there that I sort of wanted to scratch at a different time later on in that year and I was like because the other main factor about maybe wanting to give it a go or jumping was 2003 the Rugby World Cup was uh, in Australia Um, and there was a lot of press about this that and the other so that was in the press a fair bit as well so the back of my head I was thinking well it's sort of this the World Cup's coming the they're interested um, to get me across. That'll give me a year, a full season of Super Rugby or, or whatever to see if I can get in the squad. Um, so I, what I did was um, obviously talking to Australian Rugby Union at the time about negotiating a deal. But I, um, yeah, I, and, and you know, I, People think, you know, I, I jump for the money and this and that. Not, oh, I'm not going to lie. The money was great. The money was good. But the other thing was the World Cup was in Australia and I'd always, at some point in my career, wanted to go across. 
Um, because my father played rugby, my whole family played rugby. Grew up watching the All Blacks. Grew up watching the Fiji Sevens team, Serevi. Favorite players were, you know, what guys like Christian Cullen, um, and, and Tim Horan, and, and everything else. I, I knew the game. I, I knew it inside out, and I knew if I'd give it a go. I, I, I thought I'd, I reckon I would have been been okay. Um, so I decided to make the switch. Uh, at the end of the 2002 season um, and moved down to Sydney to play for the Waratahs uh, because at the time up at the Reds, I would have stayed in Queensland, I wanted to stay in Queensland, but the, the wingers were Wendell Saylor and, and Ben Chun and Wendell was obviously going all right. I don't know if he played in, in test matches yet, but uh, and Ben Chun was the incumbent uh, test winger. So I was like, to give myself a chance, every chance of playing was was to, I guess, move to Sydney and making that World Cup squad was to move to Sydney uh, and play for the Waratahs, who who are a pretty good outfit, but uh, and going okay at Super Rugby. So, you know, they they were that was the ultimate decision to, to go was was the money was great, yes, but the challenge of a World Cup and the challenge to play a game I'd, I'd watched it, uh, growing up as a kid. Uh, and playing and what my father played. So, so just touching on that 2003 Rugby World Cup, uh, you played in that team that yep. upset the All Blacks in the semi-final, and we're still gutted yeah. that they didn't that they didn't pick Tana Umanga in that match. But we won't talk about that for now. And then you went <laughs> down, you went down to England in the final. Can you just talk through both of those two games? Yep, yep. Um, I tell you what, I'm not disappointed. Tana didn't play in that. <laughs> Send me off, <laughs> and um, we we were gobsmacked when they didn't pick him. Well, I know I was. I was like, "Holy hell!" Um, I don't know what the reason was. I'm sure if you probably get Tano on, he'll probably tell you. I don't know. We just knew. Paint a bit of a background. We played the Blacks uh, at the start of that year. I think in maybe June sometime. Maybe it was obviously earlier. Um, and they touched us up. They put 50 points on us in Sydney. Great team. I think Joe Rockathoko scored two or three tries. He was he was amazing um, in that black jersey. All those you know f- from about two thousand and two or three to about seven or eight. He was he was amazing. We 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 were just put away. We had a great camp. So we went into camp up in Darwin um, at the start of that two thousand three Rugby World Cup campaign, uh, which finished culminated in, in Arnhem Land. And we got a sense of you know, what Australia was about in the sense of where it's come from and, and the, you know, the first peoples um, who, who are here, the Indigenous um, people in Australia and who are representing in this, that and the other. And we had a real sense of, of ownership of, of who we were representing in the community and, and everything else and, and wearing that Wallaby jersey. So a great squad, ageing in a sense. Uh, you know, there was obviously guys like Matt Burke, Guys who'd won in '99, there was a new breed sort of coming through, uh, like myself. Guys like uh, you know George Smith was on the horizon, well and truly by then, uh, and a few other guys. You know, wanted to sort of do that jersey right. And what was great for us is we didn't really get a sense of what was going on in the you know cities around the World Cup. It was great. But we were locked away up in Coffs Harbour in camp. So after every game we played, we'd spend the night in either Brisbane or Sydney or Adelaide where we played, and then we'd fly home the next – or not fly home, fly back to Coffs Harbour, train for the week, and then come back. So we were cocooned in, in, in place in Coffs Harbour uh, every – you know, after every game. And, and I guess that sort of brought us together in a sense. And we knew – Playing the Blacks, obviously being, you know, Tana less, um, for me anyway, as a back, I thought, you know, this – who did they pick actually? Was it Leon McDonald? Yeah. At 13? Yeah, I think it was Leon. How good is this? Give me Leon McDonald any day before Tana. And, and then, uh, yeah, we just went out there with the sense that there was a quiet confidence. Uh, you know, we weren't overly confident about it, but there was a quiet confidence if – if we kept the ball away from starved them of possession, um, if we played a different way than what we had um, played them that year, uh, I think we there was a bit of a surprise tactic was 
to hold on to the ball. I think if you watch that game in replay, I think a lot of our tactics were to run the ball and keep the ball in possession um, and starve you guys of the ball. And, you know, luckily it paid off. You know, we held on to the ball. We didn't make too many mistakes. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we obviously won by – it wasn't that big a, big a scoreline. Um, yeah, we knocked you guys out. It was nice to sort of do that after, you know, you guys put our pants down by 50-odd points. Stood us in, uh, you know, a good frame of mind for the next week. So the next week, uh, you'll go back to Coffs Harbour, come back. A lot of hype, great hype uh, about the week. I love a, it. It's what you play footy for, the, the hype. Uh, you play professional for, for about the week. State of Origin was similar hype. Everyone wants to talk in the press, this, that, and the other. Yeah, no, that 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 final, I must admit, it was a great final. But I, I don't want to take too much away from the English team. They played tough, hard grinding rugby. A game where you know they played to their strengths. You know, I scored the first try in that that game as well. Uh, and that was amazing. A little story behind that, I, I, I didn't even know. We didn't even practice that. I just never practiced that at all over the, the course of, of that week was that cross kick to me from Stephen Larkham. Wouldn't have done it once. Um, I just saw him put his hand up and then he kicked the ball. I think I better chase this. I got there luckily in time. Jason Robinson, who was shorter than me, jumped over and put it down. We're off to a good start. Yeah, so that was an amazing game, amazing atmosphere. The, the English fans were you know, loud and more proud after the game, obviously, but it was great to be a part of. And and I guess for us, I think we were sort of chasing them the whole game. Elton Flatley, he was he was icing kicks just to keep us in the game. And I think uh, they deserved to to win. They were the best team in the world for, you know, the last the last four months before that. They've beaten you guys in New Zealand, I think it Yep. Um, for the first time in a long time that same year, or was it the year before? Oh, and the, at the Cape Town, um, yep, same year. Yeah, I think it was the same year. So to do that, I don't think a lot of teams have done that and still haven't done that in, in New Zealand a lot um, since. So they were the best team, and, and I guess we we nearly got them, but uh, we, were, we, were, we were definitely on the back foot chasing them most of the game, um, and they controlled that game pretty well. And it was, it, was, it was a great atmosphere and a, and a great tournament to be a part of. Hey, bro, 2006, you were selected to represent Australia in the Rugby Sevens at the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne. Oh, yeah, there you go. Alongside other Wallabies, great, bro, you know, like the Matt Giddos, Chris Lasons. Yep, How did you yep. find transition playing from Sevens to 15s? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't, bro. I was luckily back at that time, man. I think it was uh, – I don't know whether it was unlimited interchange, but it was only yeah. – I probably could have been – you know, I was at the start of the year, and I, I think definitely a different beast. Uh, you know, you've got to have an engine where you've just got to run all day. Um, not to say I wasn't fit, but it's just a different sort of a fitness. Pretty much a touch footy fitness, but you've got to tackle. And it's it's a full field. And it was, um, you know, guys now can see, you know, there are seven specialists, and there are obviously 15 specialists. Uh, we actually didn't go too bad. We beat um, South Africa in one of the semifinals. So we it was a great atmosphere, actually. I, I put it down as having um, – walking into that stadium as the last team at the, to the MCG as the home nation, um, with obviously over 100,000 people screaming uh, and doing that lap was amazing. I, I, I've done some really cool things in my life, but – having a whole nation behind you, and that stadium was unbelievable. And, and that Telstra Dome, which was called at the time, was packed every time we played. Stadium, the roof was closed. I think 35, 40,000 would, would pack that out. Go, going back to playing with Gitz, I love playing with Gitz, great player. Cameron Shepard was another one, Chris Latham. Um, it was, we had a fair squad, but we, I, I thought we did ourselves proud. We beat South Africa in the, in the quarter, sorry. Quarter final and we lost. No, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah semi final. Oh, it's all over the place. You came I'm fourth. not thinking properly. Yeah. And then we, yeah, we came fourth. We lost the third place playoff, the bronze medal game against Fiji. It was England and England and New Zealand in the final, obviously. So we we lost to England, I think, in the semi. And we, yeah, so we played Fiji in the third place playoff, and yeah, they were. And so I think Sarabi was still playing. I thought we did ourselves proud. 
and you know, obviously home nation, we, we, they wanted us to do a lot better than we did, but there were some good teams out there. New Zealand was stacked, um, seven specialists as well. I don't think there was too many other guys who were playing super rugby at the time. Um, maybe a few, but yeah, I, I remember had a great time there and uh, great to be part of the, the village and to taste that, um, you know, the game's life um, that other guys haven't um, was a blessing and uh, really, really enjoyed it. So in 07, you went on to your second Rugby World Cup in France and uh, you, you haven't had much luck against England, eh, bro? You, so what do you reckon went well, wrong at that World Cup? I don't know, man. I don't know. We, um, I don't want to point the finger at this. I, I think we probably hadn't played, had a negative game plan in a sense. We kicked away a lot of possession, I thought, in that game where we, we, our game, and Southern Hemisphere footy is running the footy, running the ball, playing with the ball in hand, giving it to the, your backs, and letting us play with the footy. We 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 didn't do that too much. They sort of forced us into a game where we, we were playing lineouts, we were playing scrums, and they had the best scrum in the world at the time. I don't know why we we, we sort of played that way. We had a young Beric Barnes at ten. Um, not to say he was overawed, but he was still very fresh. He was a greenhorn in that jersey and. Had we had Stephen Larkin, I think he got injured in the first or second game of the tournament, so he was ruled out. I think had we had Stephen Larkin, I don't want to – I'm not, and I'm actually not bagging Beric Barnes, but they were just different players um, and have different strengths. Things could have been different. But, you know, Beric went on to play a lot of tests and he's made a lot of money in Japan as well. But we, um, I, I just think we played a negative style uh, and not to the best way we could have played to our strengths. Uh, I scored a game. I try in that game again. Uh, it was it was a beautiful day. I remember it was in south of France. I think it was in Marseille. Eighty odd thousand people. The Stade Velodrome was in the afternoon. I still remember it was a nice hot day, so it was good. We were playing the English, and you know we thought we'd you know they'd get hot here, and and we'd be used to it, and this that and the other. But we just played a negative style. But what was good about you know, about that loss, in a sense, was going back to the hotel. Are uh, you? Are, I'd like me for this one, boys, but we're back to the hotel, drowning our sorrows, and went to the bar at the hotel to watch the end of the French uh, stop. All Blacks. Uh, uh, hey, hey, hey. hey, stop now. <laughs> I actually, I, I couldn't believe what, what I was watching, eh? Hey. Honestly, I was like, how is this happening? Oh, bro. Now, to those bo- you, your boys again, I was like, oh, my God. Only, only the French and a few forward passes later, I couldn't believe it. So that sort of eased the pain a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, bro, talking about the All Blacks then, you played a lot of tents against them, but unfortunately, you yep. never managed to win a bleeder so nah, tough. Man. How nah. tough was it to beat the All Blacks, bro, and, wh- and why? Uh, you guys should be proud of of them and what they do because they are, they are the best team in any sport in the world. I, I don't care about NBA, NFL, the Americans, you know, you've got your soccer teams, you've got Barcelona, the All Blacks, everyone in your country wants to represent the All Blacks, both sexes. You guys are immensely proud of what you do and you have pride in how you represent that jersey. I think it's it, it's commendable how that jersey gets left from, from guys before and, and yeah. the guys – no, they've got to play and act a certain way to wear that jersey. I think, you know, there's a great culture has been steeped in that jersey for a long time. And I think Steve Hansen, I know he's obviously not coach now, but the way he's carried that on from, you know, Graham Henry, uh, your coaches over there have done a great job in instilling and in instilling a, a sense of pride and, and how you wear that jersey. Um, and obviously the players, you've had great players. Um, blokes like Richie McCaw, Tana, um, great captains to sort of carry and pass that torch on to the next guy and to the next senior players. And I think the continuity of caliber of player and character has been immense in the jerseys and in the guys that, are, that have worn your jersey over there. It's um, it's hard to beat. You can beat. That's the thing with the All Blacks. You beat them one week uh, and you're not going to get too much of an opportunity to sort of get close to them the next week because – there is a big, big response. You know, I've had the opportunity to, to come over there and win. You know, we, we used to win a, a little bit more than we did over there in Sydney and, and different places in Brisbane. But then we'd come, we'd always go to Buddy Eden Park. <laughs> Eden Park, man. Holy hell. I, I only ever won there 
with the Waratahs, and that was late, that was like <laughs> 2007, 2008. And then I don't think I – maybe even last time I won there was in the Auckland Nines, playing rugby league. It's a fortress, man, uh, and the sense of pride that I guess record going for, for the players over there. Um, you don't yeah. want to be the first one to lose. And, yeah, it's uh, it, it's amazing, and it, it's hard to get a, a bad – not even bad or an inconsistent all black team second week. So it's going to be tough. Damn trophy back. Hey, so after 67 test matches for the Wallabies and 89 games for the Waratahs, you then signed with the Leicester Tigers for a brief stint before returning to yeah. rugby league in 2010 after a seven year absence. So signing with yeah. the West Tigers under respected coach Tim Sheens, why the move yeah. back to the NRL, bro? And how influential was Tim Sheens? And your decision to sign with the Tigers? Yeah, well, I was playing at um, I was playing at Leicester. I, I I actually had a great time at Leicester Tigers. I was only there for what five six months, um, but I could have been there for five six years. I family loved it. It was a place where you know you, you can walk down the streets, not like Australia, where it's not on the back. You're not, not on the back page every day, or not something about that. You could just live a normal life. My wife and my family loved it. We lived out in the country. You know, the street lights turned off at like 8 p.m., so there was no lights outside. It was dark. It was great. We had a great time there. But the thing was with rugby league, um, and it was more so Australia, I guess, in the way I um, left Australia. I still had questions to be answered back here. I still wanted to prove myself um, that I wasn't a finished product yet. I, I wasn't washed up or I wasn't didn't want to finish my career like that. So I still had a point to prove and, and – um, the West Tigers came calling, and, and I, I thought, this is probably the best time, better than ever, to sort of get back there. I um, mean, the West Tigers were on their way up. They had a gun young team at the time. Benji Marshall, the high, height of his powers. Um, Robbie Farah, Gareth Ellis, players like that. Um, Chris Lawrence, another guy coming through, who, who, who was going really well. And Tim Sheens um, was a coach, a guy I respected. Didn't, I hadn't met him before, really, uh, but knew, being a Canberra Raiders fan, um, he, he, he would have been a great coach. So, um, yeah, got back in 2010, and it was amazing. I get back on the Wednesday, uh, fly in on the Wednesday, go to training on, say, a holo on the Wednesday. Um, Monday is when we play, yeah, um, is the first game. And then, um, so I only have maybe one or two training sessions with the boys. I play on Monday, first touch of the footy, I score a try. It's unbelievable. Left corner, uh, we put a play on. And then that, oh, I guess that set the tone for me. Okay, I can relax now. I relaxed into the game and I relaxed into the season. Um, I had a, I thought I had a, a, a great year. You know, just missing out on the, on the, in the semi-finals, missing out on the prelim and, and getting to the grand final, um, to eventual winners, uh, St George. I think they beat us by a field goal in that preliminary final. Um, but yeah, I had a great time under Tim Sheens, as I was saying before. And talking about Wayne Bennett and having a coach have confidence in, in your ability, um, Tim Sheen was definitely that. I didn't really think about what he wanted or this, that, and the other too much. There was obviously things he wanted us to get to from a game management point of view and you know stats, this, that, and the other. But I knew intrinsically that he had faith in me to do my job. So I just went out there and did it. I must admit, playing with the West Tigers is probably the, the team I'd, I enjoyed playing and being on that field the most because we played with a certain style. Uh, we played open. You know, Benji Marshall was at six. We were trying things, you know. It was great to be a part of. Robbie Farrer at nine, he was just sort of taking the line on and doing what he did. Uh, and Tim Sheens was a coach who, who encouraged that, you know. He said, I don't mind you trying stuff, boys, but if you want to try it, do the training first. And that was, the, that was all he said, really, about doing the different plays and um, and the players had a, a real buy into sort of what we did on the field, which was great. And you know, if I ever do any coaching, which I sort of do do now with, with my with my boy who's fifteen, um, you know, I, I just let them go out there and, and go and have fun, and that's what we did at the West Tigers, which, which was which was great. So Tim Sheens was also the Kangaroos coach in 2010, and he picked you. You were the first ever player to switch from league to union and back to league again at international level. So how different was it? Yeah. In international rugby league after a seven year absence. Oh, uh, it wasn't too bad because as you know, mate, when when you play in those teams or you get picked in those squads, you know, those sessions and those uh games just are unbelievable, you know. There's not a never really a drop all the 
the quality's unbelievable. Cameron Smith, Cooper Cronk, all those guys were playing. Billy Slater, Paul Gallen. So I, I come through, when I first came through with guns like Andrew Johns and Wendell Sale and Matt Kidley and, and Brad Fittler and the like, now I'm you know, playing with with a newer brigade of um, a superstar and just great to be a part of it. and to get that opportunity again, playing a representative jersey was was great. You know, I um, you know my son was sort of oldish enough to, to sort of get that I was I was playing um, the Kangaroos again and yeah, immense pride in playing that. You know, it was a 2010 Tri Nations, which you guys won. You guys beat us in the final. He was beat us in the final in Brisbane. Um, Benji Marshall, it was unbelievable that game. He set up that last try and I think he scored it. So I think he set it up actually. It wasn't the best way to finish on a, uh, in a in a representative jersey, but to have the opportunity to, to, to wear one again was was amazing. In 2013, you moved back to Rugby Union to play for Leinster in Ireland. Six yep. weeks out from the start of the 2014 NRL season, you then signed yep. for the South Sydney Rabbitohs in a one-year deal. This would be your final season in the NRL. How special was the yep. final year playing for the Rabbits, bro, and winning another premiership ring? It was probably more the ring I'm most fond of. Not to say the Christmas one I'm not as fond of as, you know, I really had to work hard for this one. Um, I'll paint the picture. Initially, Madge was calling me when I was in Ireland. You know, I was at the back end of my career. I probably had to work harder than than, than what I sh- probably should have at the time. But I'd come back from Ireland and, and le- rugby league pre-seasons are notoriously really, really hard. Michael Maguire pre-seasons are even harder. Um, so I was actually putting him off, putting him off saying, mate, I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking about it. So I probably should have been back training um, not six weeks out before the comp, but uh, at least eight to ten I should have signed and then did the hard work. Um, but I, 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 I held off because I knew they were getting flogged um, and I probably should have gone back. But I, I'd signed six weeks before, did the did the training, struggled, struggled at, at, at pre-season training, um, but got there, started the comp. I think I played the first four rounds and, and then we lost against camp. The camp Raiders on a Sunday afternoon in Sydney, um, I dropped – a couple of balls, high balls, because I actually just couldn't see it. Um, but we lost, and I guess the the easy guy to drop is the old guy. Um, and I think I didn't think I played too bad, but I, I got dropped. Uh, and then I didn't make it back into that team. I went back to North Sydney Bears um, to play in the feeder team and our second a reserve team. Um, you know, that was humbling in, in a sense, but I knew I had to do it. But I went back there with an attitude of, you know, if I, if I do get another chance to play and get back up there, I'm not going to let it go. So I, I wasn't set in the world. I, I like playing for North Sydney, but I was just there for the team. I'm doing my job and doing everything that was required, uh, being a good team man. And then um, finally got maybe it was about six or seven, maybe even eight weeks later, I get the chance to go back up um, because there was an injury in the first grade team. And then from then on, I, I, I said to myself, as I said before, I'm not going to let this go. Um, and got through playing some pretty, a pretty good brand of, of footy with a great team, a great young team. Sam Burgess, Ben Teo, Sam's brothers, George and Tom, Luke. Uh, we just had a good real team uh, aura about us. You know, we just got the job done. The boys trained really hard in the preseason. We trained hard during the season, um, and, and we got the job done. I think we won our grand final. Our grand final was probably the week before in the prelim against Sydney Roosters, or Eastern Suburbs Roosters. Sonny Bill was playing. They go twelve nil up, um, first 10, 10 minutes. When I got there at the start of the season, the message was we weren't going to sort of do the same thing as the season before. The season before, the boys got knocked out in the prelim finals, the same game against Manly. I knew going into that game, we were 12-0 down against the Roosters in the same game 12 months later. These sort of things may be popping up. I don't know, but I guess as an older guy and who were, who wasn't there against Manly the year before, I, I just try to recollect the boys and, and get a bit of composure back. And if there was one thing I did, I think was was help in that game was help uh, get us back on track 
from a mental point of view about getting the job done and getting back and just going back and completing our sets and, and not thinking about where we were and what the scoreline was. We ended up um, scoring 30-odd unanswered points after that and letting them score maybe a couple of tries um, in that final bit of that game. But they were the, the, the benchmark all year and we got them and we beat them convincingly in that preliminary final. And we knew that the next week against the Dogs, if we went out there and just did our jobs collectively as a team, we we knew we could win, and, and that's what we did. And we we sailed away with the game in in that you know last 10, 15 minutes. We scored about two or three tries. Greg Inglis in the corner, everyone sort of jumping all over him. Um, and it was an amazing experience that year. And to finish my career uh, with, with a premiership, um, and the way we did it, it was it was unbelievable. It's it still still well, you know one of my best memories, and will be um, going forward. Cool, bro. Hey, 2014, you finish your international rugby league career where it started, playing against Samoa in a one-off yep. test for your beloved Fiji. How special was the yep. moment for you and your Vivali, your family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was uh, it was awesome. I never thought that it happened again, but I got the call up during the year. And, uh, you know, we, we lost the game. Um, it was a bit of a funny game, actually. We were going all right until one of the halfbacks got knocked out and I had to play in the halves for the second half. I had no idea what I was doing. But, um, we got around the field, but to play in that team um, and to represent for the last time, as you said, my Vuvale, um, it was um, it was unbelievable to, to represent Fiji again um, and to bookend what I did. Um, it's amazing how my career went in that sense from a rugby league point of view. 2000 was a premiership year. Played for Fiji, captain Fiji. 2014 was the next time I played for Fiji and won a premiership. So it was a great way to to finish um, and represent Fiji again and wear that white jersey, um, which is, you know, hanging with pride in, in, in my house here. Nice one. Beautiful, bro. Hey, so looking back at your illustrious career, what's the one thing you are most proud of, brother? Well, from a career point of view, I guess just the longevity in in what I did and representing the teams that, that I that I have and representing them with, with gusto, I guess. I, I'm really proud of, of, of what I did. I, I pride in, in, in the way I represented the, the jerseys I played in. So you were coached by some of the best in the business in both union and league. Wayne Bennett, Eddie Jones, yep. Tim Sheens, Michael Maguire, just to name a few. What were the secrets yep. of their success that brought the best out of you as a player? The secrets of their success that brought the best of me out as a player? I guess um, being there for each other as a team um, and playing for each other and the pissing inside the circle analogy rather than you know looking outwards for, 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 pro- for solving problems. So that was great. And just enjoying yourself. You know, I uh, teams that I enjoyed myself uh, at training and, and as a team and, and as a squad off the field uh, were the most – I had the most fun and, and they were the most uh, – the teams where I had the most success. Uh, not taking things too seriously. Going out there and enjoying yourself. That, that was the most – so enjoying yourself as a squad and as a team and playing for each other. Since you retired from rugby and league, you returned to Fiji on a regular basis. And in 2016, yep. you were honoured with your own plaque on the Singatoka Rugby Walk of Fame. And you're an ambassador for the annual yeah. Fiji Coral Coast Sevens as well. And a strong supporter of your village team, Latu Felice. How important Absolutely. is it for you to give back, bro, and stay connected with the people and your native country? Terribly important. I think um, that's obviously what my where I'm from and what I de- identify with. And I have immense pride in... in, in representing them. So I, uh, really, I just want to sort of give back and, and share what I can um, and share my experiences and uh, and, and my knowledge to, to sort of make things better over there um, and put my name on things that can help things back in Fiji, obviously. Um, you know, they obviously don't have a lot of money and, uh, and, and other material things, but, um, you know, they've given me so much uh, from a – you know, learning point of view from a culture point of view, um, it's easy to give back. And I think it's terribly important that guys do do that. And I think a lot of guys are doing more of that um, within their own communities. I see a lot of, uh, you know, Kiwi boys do that. Um, the Aboriginal boys are starting to do that um, in here in Australia. So 
I just um, I, I guess if I can be a a good example for that, um, it's great. No, and I actually just enjoy it. I just enjoy going back. I enjoy uh, seeing family. I enjoy having my uh, family go and have some experiences with family over there. So it's just great to be a part of. So your wife's Rebecca and you've got three kids. Bro, how, yep. how important is family to you? Oh, terribly important. I, I I wouldn't have played the way I had without um, a great support network. Uh, and my wife's first and foremost of that. Um, and, and, you know, just, just, just helping me out and, and keeping pressures away when I was playing at the time and now, um, support in we're doing things. You know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm being a father now. And I'm happy, uh, you know, dropping the kids to school. You know, doing that, helping them with their homework. You know, going down the park, playing footy with them a fair bit more, rather than you know not having that time. Now I I'm enjoying that part of my life. Uh, so that I'm, I'm really thankful that you know they were there for me then, and now I'm there for them now. Just bear with me here, bro. After a massive career, going from league to rugby to sevens to league to rugby back to league, yep. what yep. are you up to now? I am um, spending a fair bit of time being being a father to these three boys, Samson, Emossi, and uh, Max. And I've also um, co-founded in a influencer marketing agency called Huzu. Uh, so we're buying and selling it, advertising through social media and big followers. Um, on on their social accounts so instagram twitter mainly tiktok is, is a big thing now i'm not on the, a lot of these things myself but um it's the way of the world and the way things are going um and kids are, are, are loving these uh these the social social things and uh we're just trying to get on the back of it and uh you know do well for ourselves so finally uh with aru ceo railing castle and nrl ceo todd greenberg under quite a bit of pressure at the moment with the coronavirus yeah. stuff happening what are your thoughts on the current state of both australian rugby and the nrl at the moment i'm feeling a bit sorry for railing castle you know she she hasn't had obviously had the best time she got handed a thing that was not going too well I don't know the ins and outs of what's going on, but I think she's trying the best she is, um, and the, the best of what she's been given. Uh, there's a lot of people who are talking about what she has and hasn't done, and you know what she could do and not do, and this, that, and the other. But she's got to do something soon. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that that are in the fire at the moment for her, where she's got to make some de- decisions and. And everything else, but I think she, for what she was given, she she did a, a, a fair job, and she's doing a fair job. I think she should be left to, to sort of do to do that, but given some good support around her, um, I think she'll do that. Uh, Tom Greenberg in the NRL situation, I really hope they get that uh, the competition off the ground. I'm here, and they're going to get that off this year at some point. I don't know whether that will happen. I'd love for. Both coaches will be playing um, again. I don't see rugby union playing this year, but I do see rugby league. Uh, there seems to be more traction in that, uh, and I think there's, uh, you know, they're talking about July starting a competition then um, with two different uh, conferences and this, that, and the other. But the good thing is, at least they're talking about it, and it, it gives hope for for guys like myself who still want to watch the footy on the weekend. I didn't realise I missed it so much. Um, when there's nothing or no sport on. So hopefully they can get something going soon and listen to the proper health experts in how to count on what we're all coming up against. Yeah, I, I'm hoping you know they'll, they'll, they'll get back on the field very, very soon. It's been an awesome podcast. Lotte. Awesome, boys. Yes, but we've got something there. We always we always finish with this challenge, bro. It's called Pick Up the Pace Challenge. Yep. Uh, you have to name nine answers to one question in 10 seconds. Nine answers so to one question. Um, in 10 seconds, bro. And okay, um, yep. if you ever over Aotearoa, bro, we'll hook you up with some crayfish and some really good Kai Moana. Yeah, <laughs> that's the one, man. All right, bro. I don't know. I'll do the timing. Yeah. You do you, you do the counting, bro. We've got 10 seconds. All right, here we go. You ready, brother? Yep. Oti, Tengeri from Namatakula, Fiji. Yep. Name for me, nine current or former rugby union or rugby league wingers. Go. Former. Rugby Union or Rugby League? Uh, Richie Barnett, Wendell Saylor, Adam McDougall, 
third. Oh, so I'm gone. gone. <laughs> you, you're going to get a lot of fun. Yeah, it's sort of that real. Yeah, it's, that's not easy. You're going to get a lot of phone calls from the brothers, eh? <laughs> yeah, it comes easy. up hard on you, eh? Damn. It's not easy. Yeah, that. Like, it sounds, easy, it sounds easier than buddy it is, eh? <laughs> We've only had Lance or Hire take it out. Oh, he's smart, man. He's got his quick on his feet. That's right. That's right. <laughs> hey, Lotte, just we hear while you while you were at the Fiji Coral Coast Sevens earlier this year that your go to karaoke song is Material Girl. Is there any truth to this? <laughs> <laughs> I think I. I think I'll dance to that one, but uh, I don't know if I'm too good a too, too good a singer that one. But yeah, no, it's, it's always a good time, and I've got to get Kenny Laban back on the dance floor when we get back there. That's right. <laughs> yeah. In all seriousness, Lotte Vanaka Vakalevu, thank you very much for joining us on the Pick Up the Pace podcast. You and your Vivali take care, and all the very best for your future endeavors. Mati, see you later, brother. Cheers, boys. Thank you very much.